Hi, everyone. Welcome to Church Online. Glad you're here with us today. Uh, Pastor George is currently up in New Hampshire with our youth group playing in the snow this weekend at a uh, deep freeze youth camp. So he's asked me to fill in for him today, and I am really happy to be here with you. Um, I believe the message that God has for you today is going to be a great encouragement to each one of you. And before I get going any further, I just want to let you know I'm recording this uh, sitting in our living room on my couch, and it's kind of chilly outside, and we've got a fire going in the fireplace uh, over here next to me, so if you happen to hear some snap, crackle, and pop, it's just the wood in the fireplace. So why don't we get started? Uh, Jackie and I saw a movie last week at the movie theater called Sing 2. It's a cute animated movie about a bunch of animals that have to overcome some major obstacles to put on a dazzling musical stage performance. And there was a song written for the movie called Your Song Saved My Life. Now, my family and Pastor George all know that I have a soft spot for beautifully crafted song lyrics. And this song has a section that says, Your song saved my life, the worst and best days of my life. I was broken. Now I'm open. Your love keeps me alive. It keeps me alive. It's a sweet, sentimental song, and I've listened to it about a dozen times since seeing the movie last week. And the song got me thinking that, well, Many of us have songs, songs that resonate with us in certain ways, songs that are meaningful and maybe take us back to a special time in our lives. So let me ask you as we get started, what's your song? If you know me well enough, you can imagine that I have several songs that I would claim as my songs. I won't go through them all here, but I'll mention a couple of them. First, Where the Streets Have No Name by U2 opens with these poetic words. I want to run. I want to hide. I want to tear down the walls that hold me inside. I want to reach out and touch the flame where the streets have no name. And my wife Jackie and I have a song that together we call our song. It's by a group called Lone Star, and the song is called Amazed. And the chorus goes like this. I don't know how you do what you do. I'm so in love with you. It just keeps getting better. I want to spend the rest of my life with you by my side forever and ever. Every little thing that you do, baby, I'm amazed by you. It's sweet, right? And it, it captures the essence of how I feel for my bride of more than 23 years now. Well, those are just a couple of examples, but most of my songs are actually pretty melancholy, deep, emotional, symbolic, and poetic. It's, it's just the way that I roll. I mean, I'm kind of a stoic guy, steady, faithful, diligent. Other people have different personalities and different tastes in music. In fact, I asked my wife what some of her songs were, and one of them was I'm Coming Out by Diana Ross. In that song, Diana sings, there's a new me coming out, and I just have to live, and I want to give. I'm completely positive. I think this time around, I am going to do it like you never knew it. Oh, I'll make it through. The time has come for me to break out of the shell. I have to shout. And then Jackie said one of her other songs is September by Earth, Wind & Fire. You know the one, right? It's got those super deep lyrics like, Badia, say, do you remember? Badia, dancing in September. Badia, golden dreams were shiny days. Badia, dia, dia, badia, dia, dia. Badia, dia, dia, dia. Pretty profound, right? And for those of you who know Jackie, those songs make sense, right? She's the fun loving, cheery, life of the party, joyful kind of person. And well, I'm the more serious and contemplative one. But but that's okay, right? I mean, everybody is wired differently, and that's the way God intended it to be. However, Late last year, as I was having my quiet time with God one morning, I came across a verse in the Bible that I've read probably hundreds of times in my life. Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And I felt like God started gently asking me, 
if I was actually demonstrating all of that fruit in my life. So I started having a bit of a debate with God, you know, kind of getting pretty defensive. I mean, I'm loving, I'm typically at peace, I'm kind to others, I'm a good guy, I'm very very faithful, you know, and, but when I got to joy, well, God started to show me that I wasn't as joyful as I could and perhaps should be for someone who is claiming to be a joy-filled Christian. I had actually just finished preaching about joy in early December, and God started challenging me to self-reflect, to dig a bit deeper, and to consider whether maybe I had some room to grow in that area. And then I came upon another verse in 1 Peter that says this, You love him, Jesus, even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him, and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. When I saw that, I had to ask myself, do I daily, regularly do that? Do I walk around living my life rejoicing with a glorious, inexpressible joy? And my honest answer was, well, no. But why not? What was I missing? And that started me on a path that has led me to this message today. I don't have it all figured out yet. This isn't going to be some deep theological peer-reviewed dissertation on all things joy. These are simply some thoughts I've been having recently, and, and I thought I'd share a bit about this journey that I've been on with you. Now, with that long introduction out of the way, my first point for today is this. God wants me to be joyful. I know that may not be incredibly profound to some of you, but please don't disengage. I'm going somewhere with this. The Bible is filled with scriptures that point to the idea that God wants us to be joyful. Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And Proverbs 17, 22 says, A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. And in Colossians, Paul writes, We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy. So, okay, clear enough, right? If we consider ourselves Christians, if we are followers of Jesus Christ, then we should be filled with joy. And not just joy, but great joy. And to be clear, the word used for joy in the Bible means to be glad, to be merry-hearted, to delight. Now, does this mean we're supposed to just put on a happy face and smile regardless of how we feel? I don't think that's the answer. That's not the way God rolls. He doesn't want us to be fake. So what then? What do I need to do to be more joyful? A few years ago, Jackie and I went on a date to an escape room. Have any of you ever been to one of those? Uh, if you're watching this and you have been, put a, uh, put a thumbs up or, or let us know that you've been to one of those escape rooms. You go to one of these places, you get together with some people and go into a room, a room where you have to discover clues, solve puzzles, and accomplish certain tasks in order to accomplish a specific goal in a limited amount of time. Now, I'm a pretty competitive guy, so I was confident that we were going to absolutely nail this series of challenges. When the clock started and Jackie and I got going in our escape room, we found the first clue and I immediately broke the game. Literally. I did something that no one had ever done before, and I accidentally dropped a critical piece of a puzzle in such a manner that the escape room was going to be impossible to solve. We were stuck only like two minutes into our 60 minutes. Now, thankfully, one of the observers realized what I had done. He came in, reset the room, and allowed us to start again, and ultimately, we finished the game. And it's a good thing that guy came in, because without his help, there was no way we were going to solve the puzzle, because I got it wrong from the very start. Now, I bring that story up because, to be honest, if you're looking to solve the what do I need to be more joyful puzzle, I think that asking what do I need to do to be more joyful is actually the wrong question. If we start there, we're in danger of getting stuck and never being able to solve the puzzle. You see, as, as I've started digging into what the Bible has to say about joy, I've come to recognize that the real question isn't, what do I need to do to be more joyful? The real question is, who? Who do I need in my life to be more joyful? 
And this leads to our second point of the message today, which is God is the source of my joy. This might seem like a simple truth and maybe one that you've already figured out, but but please stay with me. You see, I, I've been a, a Christian most of my life. I've read the Bible all the way through several times. I've spent hundreds of hours in church services, um, thousands of hours in church services, led worship and sung about joy hundreds of times. And yet recently, God started showing me that I've been missing out on some aspects of what it actually means to be joyful. And primarily, I've been blind to the truth that God really is the source of my joy because he himself is a joyful God. I'm going to be honest with you. My mind does not typically default to thinking about God as joyful. Here's what I mean. The Bible says things like this. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's from Psalm 1611. And in Psalm 43, verse 4, we read, There I will go to the altar of God, to God, the source of all my joy. I will praise you with my harp, O God, my God. These are beautiful verses and ones that I've read and meditated on before, and I thought I had understood them, but God has been showing me that there's been a bit of a disconnect in my mind over the years. Before I go on, let me remind you that The Bible makes it clear that there is one God who eternally exists as three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is known as the doctrine of the Trinity. And when I casually think about the Trinity or think about who God is, or maybe I should say when I think about the personality that God has, here's some of what comes to my mind. Let's start with the Holy Spirit. When I think about the Holy Spirit, I think of verses like this in the Bible. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. That's Matthew 3.16. And then John 16.8 says, And when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. And then Romans 8 Verse 26 says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. Okay, so, and again, this is just where my mind goes. The Holy Spirit is a floating dove who convicts me of my sin and prays for us with groanings? Uh, Well, then, then there's God the Son, Jesus. Isaiah writes this about Jesus. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. Or in Matthew, we we read this. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. And then Luke writes down an account of Jesus talking to a group of religious leaders. Jesus says this about himself. The Son of Man, on the other hand, feasts and drinks, and you say... He's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. Okay, so from these verses, we get this image of Jesus as a man of sorrows, a compassionate healer, and a friend of sinners. And finally, we have God the Father. Proverbs 3.19 says, By wisdom the Lord founded the earth. By understanding he created the heavens. And in Psalms 147 It says, he counts the stars and calls them all by name. How great is our Lord. His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond comprehension. And how about this from Psalm 75? It is God alone who judges. He decides who will rise and who will fall. And finally, 1 John 4, verse 16 says, We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. So from these verses, we see that God is all-wise, all-powerful, kind of judgy and stern, but also loving. Now, the Bible is also very clear that God is faithful and kind, and the Holy Spirit is gentle and our comforter. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and on and on. And and I'm not trying to make, make light of the character of God, but the issue is that in my mind, very rarely do I think about God as being joyful. And yet, 
as I've been doing my own personal study over the past several weeks, I've come to see that God is in fact a God of joy. And most of the scriptures that point this out are clear as day about it. I've just been reading them sort of incorrectly for most of my life. Let's start with God the Son. Look at what Jesus says in John 15, 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And a little later in John 17, 3, when Jesus is praying to his Father in heaven, he says, Now I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world, so they would be filled with my joy. In both of these verses, Jesus uses the phrase, my joy, and he indicates that we can be filled with it. And if you think about it, Jesus must have exuded joy. The Bible records different stories about Jesus interacting with children and others who were typically shunned in first century Israel. Those people wanted to hang out with Jesus. And if Jesus was always walking around somber and serious, I don't think people would have been so drawn to be near him. As for the Holy Spirit, have a look at these verses. Acts 13.52 says, And the believers were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 1.6 says, So you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. And earlier we visited a verse in Galatians 5 that I want to look at again. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If if the Holy Spirit is pictured as a, a fruit tree, and that tree produces fruit that includes joy, then the Holy Spirit must have joy. I mean, think about it. You can't get apples from an orange tree. In in fact, I feel like God gave me a deep spiritual truth that I want to share with you. Are you ready? If you need a thing, you can't get that thing from a person or place that doesn't have the thing. Okay, let, let me say it again in case you weren't listening. If you need a thing, you can't get that thing from a person or place that doesn't have the thing. Now, I recently needed to get a new battery for my car. Now, I didn't go to Daybreak Coffee Roasters. I didn't go to TJ Maxx. And as much as I love Giovanni's Pizza, I didn't go there. No, I went to AutoZone. I needed a car battery, so I went to a source that has car batteries. So if I need more joy, I need to go to a source that has joy to give. I think we all get tricked sometimes into going to the wrong source when we are looking for joy. Some go to Netflix or others turn to the bar or pornography or even other people. And while some of these things might give us temporary feelings of happiness, those things are not true sources of joy. It is the Lord himself and the Lord alone who has unlimited joy on tap for us. We just need to, first of all, recognize that he wants us to be joyful, understand that he is our source of joy, and then allow him to fill us with his joy. And remember, it's his joy. We can't create joy in ourselves. It's a work of the Spirit. Being filled with inexpressible joy is the natural response to seeing how truly good God is in comparison to how broken we are. Joy is meant to be the overflow of true, tangible relationship with a God who would lay down his life solely because he desperately longed for a restored relationship with you and me. Now, I've briefly highlighted some verses to prove that Jesus and the Holy Spirit both have joy. But let me show you that God the Father is joyful as well. In fact, God is the inventor of joy, happiness, and fun. We already touched on a couple of these verses, but I want to bring them back. Psalm 1611 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And Psalms 43, 4 says, There I will go to the altar of God, to God, the source of all my joy. And in 1 Chronicles 16, it says, Honor and majesty surround him. Strength and joy fill his dwelling. And finally, in the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, the prophet tells the people, Don't be dejected and sad, for the joy of the Lord 
is your strength. It's the joy of the Lord that gives us strength, not joy that we try to muster up from within. It's his joy at work inside of us that is unlike any other strength that we can find in ourselves. So I've touched on the fact that God wants us to be joyful and that God is the source of our joy because he is, in fact, a joyful God. But as I continued to, to dig into this over the past couple of couple of months, I started to ask myself, well, why? Why is God so joyful? Let's have a look at Luke chapter 15. We drop in on Jesus telling a story. He says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Jesus then goes on to tell a story of a woman who loses a silver coin, 10% of her money. But after searching her whole house, she finds it, calls her friends, and throws a party. Then Jesus says, in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. And then Jesus goes on to tell the story that is known as the parable of the prodigal son. Many of you may be familiar with it. And, and for time's sake, I won't read the whole thing here. But the story follows a young man who takes his portion of his inheritance, leaves his father, and travels to a distant land where he wastes all the money on wild living. Eventually, he comes to his senses and he returns home where he's hoping that maybe his dad will have enough mercy on him to at least hire him as a servant. But Jesus says that while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. The father then throws a huge party. His older son gets jealous, and the dad says this, We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. In each of these situations, the man who found his lost sheep, the woman who found her lost coin, and the man whose son returned home, we have a picture of God rejoicing because one of his lost children has finally come home to him. And this leads us to our last point. God is joyful because of me. Look at these scripture passages with me. Psalm 147 verses 10 and 11 says, He takes no pleasure in the strength of a horse or in human might. No, the Lord's delight is in those who fear him, those who put their hope in his unfailing love. And Isaiah 62, 5 says, your children will commit themselves to you, O Jerusalem, just as a young man commits himself to his bride. Then God will rejoice over you as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. It's clear from these verses that God takes delight in you and me. But take note, it's not just that God created mankind and thought, oh, wow, men and women, they're so wonderful. They make me so happy. No, when, when sin entered the world, you and I were separated from God. We were lost, just like the sheep, the coin, and the, the young son in the earlier stories. But when we accept the gift of salvation that comes through faith in Jesus, that relationship is restored, and God rejoices. Check this out in Ephesians. Even before he made the world, God loved us, and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Jackie and I, we've never adopted any children. All three of our kids are our very own DNA. But I do have friends who have adopted, and I have heard some amazing stories about the excitement and joy that filled their hearts on the day that they were able to rescue that child and call that child their very own. And this is the picture that's painted for us in the Bible. God is that father who rejoices when you and I are adopted into his family. And we get another glimpse of what brings God joy when we look at Hebrews chapter 12. It says this, 
and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Look at that phrase. Because of the joy awaiting him, that's Jesus, he endured the cross. What was the joy awaiting Jesus? Surely it wasn't the pain and humiliation of being nailed naked to a Roman cross. No, he looked past the cross and was willing to go through the suffering because he knew that after the cross came resurrection. And after resurrection came him being seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. And once he was seated there, he would be able to start the next phase of his high priestly ministry to intercede for everyone who would ever come to him in time of need. As Jesus hung on that cross, he looked out across eons of time and saw the faces of people who would be saved because of what he was doing. He saw you. He saw me. And that joy was enough to make him willing to endure his death on the cross. I briefly mentioned my three kids a few minutes ago. Our kids are no longer really kids. At at age 14, 17, and 20, they're pretty much all grown up. But I can very easily recall when they were very little. When Jordan, our firstborn, was a baby, I can vividly remember times when she needed help falling asleep. Jackie and I would take turns cradling Jordan in our arms, walking around the nursery or sitting in a rocking chair, doing our best to calm her down and help her fall asleep. Often we would sing to her. One of the songs was from Veggie Tales, and it went like this. It said, think of me every day, hold tight to what I say, and I'll be close to you even from far away. Know that wherever you are, it is never too far. If you think of me, I'll be with you. And there was another song that that Jackie actually wrote for Jordan. It went like this. J-O-R-D-A-N, Jordan is your name. God made me special, just like he made you. God gave you wisdom and beauty too. J-O-R-D-A-N. Jordan is your name. By the way, we came up with songs for our boys too, but I'll skip over them for now. Our boys are at youth camp this weekend anyway, so they'll probably never even hear this message. But you see, we, we sang over our daughter because, well, she was our child. We loved her then. And we love her now unconditionally. And just having her there with us in our arms, safe and protected, gave us so much joy that we couldn't help but sing over her. And did you know that God does the same thing with you and with me? Although I'm sure he's a better singer than I am. But in the Old Testament book of Zephaniah, God gives the prophet a glimpse into the future. A day when his people, including you and me, are restored into right relationship with him. And he says this, For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take the light in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. What song is God singing over you today? It's not a mean and angry one. It's not a song of shame or rejection. It's a joyful song, one that tells you how glad he is that you are his child. And he wants all of us to understand that he wants us to be joyful. He is our source of joy, and he is joyful because you are his child. And if you are not yet one of God's children, if you have not yet put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to know that it's not too late for you. God still wants you to be a part of his family. He wants you to be one of his kids. So ultimately, the answer to becoming more joyful is not a matter of self-talk or tricking your mind into being happy. The answer lies in simply choosing, am I going to set my heart on things above 
Am I going to choose to immerse myself into the presence of my heavenly father who loves me unconditionally? Am I going to choose to connect myself to Jesus who is the source of my joy? Am I going to choose to invite the Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and direct me so that I can pick from his joy tree? God wants desperately to make his presence known to you in every area of your life. He longs to do life with you, equipping you to live with total joy by filling you with his love every minute of every day. You can have joy because your God rejoices over you. You are not a failure in his eyes. He loves who you are. He is wholeheartedly glad that you are his. He longs to fill you with the knowledge of his gladness today. He wants to give you a revelation of how deeply in love with you he is. You are not a mistake. You were made intentionally because your God longed to have relationship with you. You are what God has most desired in the earth. And by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, you have given him what he has always wanted. God rejoices over you today, just as you are. He wants to give you ears to hear his joyful singing so that you might have the same perspective for yourself as he has for you. So what's your song? My hope and prayer for you is that your song will be the one that God is joyfully singing over you today and every day until we get to eternity, when we will be permanently reunited with our Heavenly Father and we'll be able to celebrate together in His presence forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for reminding us today that you want us to be joyful and that you are the source of our joy. And I thank you that we can have joy because you rejoice over us when we become one of your children by putting our faith in Jesus. I pray that each one of us, each person watching, and me myself will be filled with an abundant joy that can only come from a fresh, tangible revelation of your overwhelming love for us. And I pray that each one of us would have ears to hear the song that you are joyfully singing over us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today for Church Online. Don't forget to check out our website for updates, information on how to connect, and for ways to reach out to us if you would like prayer. And don't forget to come back next week, either online or in person, for another service with the River Church. See you later.